I just uh, killed my dad. Um, you know, what do I need to tell you? Uh, you? So you said you just killed your dad? Yeah. Okay, and what's the address? Um, it's, I think it's 17886 Green Moss Avenue. 17886 Green Moss? Avenue, I think. Um, okay, yeah. and um, is he is he still alive or? He might be. I don't know. There's blood on the floor, so I know he's at least been shot once. Okay. I shot three times at him. He's on the ground. Okay, you shot him three times with a gun. Yes. Okay. What are you saying? No. Or at least I tried to. Okay. He tried to attack me. We got into a pit fight, so I ran and in his room and locked the door and grabbed the gun. And I unlocked the door and he tried to get and then I shot him. Okay, and and around what age is your father? Uh fifty something. Okay, fifty. Okay. And are you there right now or have you left? No, I'm still here. Okay. You still at your dad's house? Yes. All right, and what's your name? Anthony Joseph Thompson. Okay, and do you know exactly where you shot him at? The area? I aimed for the head by my aim in the chest. I'm not quite sure. There are few things as hair raising as a killer calm in the aftermath of their crime, but does his composure during the call signal a lack of a conscience? Or are the circumstances that led to his father's death far darker than anyone could have imagined? June 3, 2019, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 17-year-old Anthony Tamplay had grabbed a gun, turned it on his own father, and shot him three times. Police arrived at the scene to find 53-year-old Bert Tamplay still breathing. Bert was rushed to hospital and placed on life support. Anthony was arrested for attempted manslaughter. There would be no recovery for his gunshot victim, though. After four days, the machines were turned off and Bert was pronounced dead. Anthony had shown no emotion while making his confession to 911 dispatchers. His story that he had been attacked also held little weight in the eyes of the law, as Anthony had no bruises or signs of violence anywhere on his body. He was charged with second-degree murder. Was this a case of an out-of-control teenager brutally killing his own father? Or was Anthony Tanplay desperately looking for a way to escape an abusive situation? In the months that followed Anthony's arrest, chilling details began to emerge. Anthony alleged that moments prior to the shooting, his father had entered his room with the intent of searching through the contents of Anthony's phone. The father and son then got into a fight. Anthony barricaded himself inside his room, grabbed a gun, and when his father broke his way inside, Anthony fired three shots. This shocking story made headlines across the United States. But in addition to giving his case a major dose of notoriety, it also alerted a long-lost relative to the situation. Natasha Thompson, Anthony's estranged sister, came forward and revealed that Anthony had been taken from his family home in Texas by Father Bert, 11 years earlier. Before she spotted Anthony on the news, she had no idea if her brother was even alive. Anthony was just five years old when his dad snatched him away from his mother. For Anthony, it was the beginning of over a decade of abuse. For Natasha and Anthony's mother, Teresa, though, it was the end of their own physically traumatic nightmare. Natasha detailed the relationship between Bert and Teresa, while highlighting just how difficult it would have been for Anthony after he was abducted. Bert and my mom were together for about 10 years and it was extremely violent. I can only imagine what Anthony's been through. When he was a baby, Bert would hold him in his arms while abusing my mother. Natasha Thompson reports that Bert had been jailed for assaulting Teresa while she was pregnant with Anthony only backed up these claims. Therese revealed that she spent an entire week in bed as a result of the vicious attack. Bert's deeply disturbing behavior continued after Anthony was born. When Bert's son was just seven months old, he kidnapped him leaving Teresa with no option but to call the police. Bert was caught, and Anthony was brought back home safe, but no charges were filed against the abusive father. The unrelenting harm Bert was doing to his own family would not stop until he abducted Anthony in 2007. After realizing that Anthony had been taken once again, 
Teresa filed a missing persons report for her son. She filled her neighborhood with missing persons posters, but Bert was long gone. He took Anthony to Louisiana, and in order to keep Anthony's whereabouts secret, Bert isolated the young boy from the outside world. For the next 12 years, school was not an option, with Anthony rarely even being allowed to leave his own bedroom. After Bert's death, some people in the neighborhood revealed that they had never actually seen Anthony in person, though they were familiar with Bert's strange behavior. The 53-year-old was also known for often appearing drunk. When questioned about the years Anthony had spent as a prisoner to his father, Anthony's sister Netisha did her best to fight her brother's corner. He has been secluded and abused all these years by his own father. My brave brother had to defend himself for the last time against that evil man. Netisha Thompson the horrific truth about Bert Tan play was now out for the world to see. Anthony opened up about how his dad would punch, kick, and throw him, and that these beatings would sometimes go on for hours. Bert had also been physically abusive to his ex-wife, Susan. The violence against her was so deplorable that on one occasion, Bert knocked out some of Susan's teeth. Susan actually filed a protection order just a few months before the shooting, leaving no question as to whether anyone in law enforcement was aware of Bert's unforgivable actions. On the fateful day that Anthony took his father's life, Bert suspected that his son had been in contact with Susan, who Anthony knew as his stepmother. This prompted the frightful father to search Anthony's phone for evidence of their conversations. This is when an argument escalated into a physical altercation. This would be the final time that Bert Tanplay would lay his abusive hands on his son, or anyone else for that matter. With Bert's death, the terrifying cycle of abuse was finally broken. Anthony may have escaped the prison of an abusive household, but he was still locked behind bars. Prosecutors eventually confirmed that Anthony had been made to suffer years of abuse and was in fact acting in self-defense the night that he shot his father three times. The young man's charge was reduced to manslaughter. Two years after the death of his father, Anthony pled no contest to negligible homicide. He was sentenced to five years of supervised probation with credit for time served. Anthony Tanplay now has a chance at a future. As part of his probation order, he will complete his GED. He will also have a chance to experience things that many of us take for granted. After being caged up from the world by his own parent, Anthony will be able to go out and make friends, travel and experience nature. And most importantly, he will be able to heal from the appalling treatment he has been made to suffer throughout most of his life so far. Anthony is now focused on rebuilding a relationship with his mother. His case was eventually highlighted on the small screen in a Netflix documentary series titled I Just Killed My Father. It has made Anthony Tan play a name known across the world and helped to raise awareness of the dangers of domestic abuse. Bert Tan play chose to live his life inflicting misery on others. But what makes his story so sickening is that the very people he abused were the ones he was supposed to love the most. We can never really be certain of what goes on behind closed doors, but with so many reports of abuse, it's clear that somebody should have been able to open the door that Anthony was locked behind. How old does a child need to be to fully understand the reality of life and death? For five-year-old Tia Hearn Len, she could see the blood, but she may not have fully understood what had just happened to her parents. Whatever her grasp on the situation was, tragically, it was one she will never be able to forget. After finding her parents the victims of a ruthless murder, this little girl had the composure and the smarts to call for help. An incredible achievement in itself, though it does not make Tia's 911 call any less heartbreaking to hear. 911, where's your emergency? Um, hello. Hello. Is everything okay? Um, my mommy and daddy uh-huh. I think there's a bullet on the floor. Where's mommy at? She, I, uh, I don't know. I think they're dead. What do you mean, sweetheart? I don't know. Okay, your daddy's on the floor. How old are you? I'm five years old, and I have a dog in the house. Okay, baby, okay. And Let me get something right over to you. Did, you. did you go in your mommy and daddy's room? Uh-huh, and there's blood. All over the place? Not all over. There's blood on the plant and blood on the floor. Oh, my goodness. And you have your little doggie with you? And three cats. Well, but, and you got some cats, too? Three cats and one dog. Okay. Are you the only Are you the only one there with, besides Mommy and Daddy? 
Daytona Beach, Florida, March 28, 2005. Little Tia Hearn Len had just awoken to the terrifying sound of a gunshot. The young girl, who was yet to even start school, headed to her parents' bedroom to find her father lying lifeless. The chilling 911 that quickly followed from Tia framed these deaths as a murder mystery. It also raised the question as to how Tia herself had managed to avoid contact with the killer. Tia seemed to believe that this may have been a robbery, but the truth is actually far more disturbing. The killings of 29-year-old Denias Hearn Len and his 31-year-old wife Julia were carried out by a criminal out for revenge. 33-year-old David Edward Johnson had targeted the Hearn Lens after he had been arrested for drug possession. Johnson believed that Little Tia's parents were behind his arrest and that they had tipped off the authorities about Johnson growing and having possession of large quantities of In reality, Neither Aeneas nor Julia had been to the police regarding Johnson and his criminal activity where drugs were concerned. They were not involved in any investigation that led to his arrest. This does not mean that they weren't acquainted with their killer though. At one time, the Hearn Lens and Johnson had reportedly been friends, whether that was true or not. No one ever expected such a frightful fallout. After his arrest, David Edward Johnson allegedly began stalking the surf-loving couple. He had arrived at the conclusion that his former pals had snitched on him, calling the police and reporting his criminal activities. This was untrue, but it didn't stop Johnson from seeking vengeance. He set out to ruin the lives of the Hearn Lens. Things eventually got so bad that Julia went to the police. Just a few months before Tia would wake up to find her parents dead, Julia attempted to get a court-ordered injunction to keep Johnson away from her family. This was their one chance to keep the family safe, to keep the family from being destroyed forever, but a judge denied the request, 
citing insubstantial evidence to go with the stalking claims. Johnson had not yet been violent at this point. There was no real proof that he had even been stalking the Hearn lens. It was simply Julia's word, and ultimately, it wasn't enough to prevent her senseless death. When questioned about the case after the murders had been committed, Circuit Judge Richard Graham revealed that he wished he'd have acted differently at the time. It was hard to prove stalking with the allegations. Looking back on it, I would have liked to have done it differently. But you review each case on a case-by-case -case basis. Judge Richards regrets mean little today, but for those of you hoping that David Edward Johnson was caught and brought to justice for the truly macabre murders, you may be in for a shock. After shooting Tia's parents, Johnson headed home, and later that day, he took his own life before authorities could arrest him. There was no note, no motivation or explanation for his actions. Did he know that five-year-old Tia was in the house? Could things have been even worse had Johnson stumbled upon her bedroom? We will never know, but we do know that with two gunshots, David Edward Johnson took the lives of two innocent parents. News channels, both local and national, honed in on Tia's heartbreaking story. At just five years old, and after discovering a gruesome murder scene in which her own mom and dad were the victims, Tia kept her composure, spoke clearly to the 911 dispatcher, and provided them with all the information she was asked for. Sheriff Ben Johnson, when Tia made the horrifying discovery that night, her father Aeneas was actually still alive. The 29-year-old man was not pronounced dead until he reached the Halifax Medical Center in Daytona Beach. After surviving the ordeal, one would not expect a swift recovery. Tia moved to live with her grandparents in Central Florida soon after the deaths of her mother and father. Today, Tia's in her early 20s, she has carried on with her life while keeping out of the spotlight. She has never spoken about what she witnessed that fateful night, and we have no way of knowing just how much of it she remembers. Perhaps the most disturbing part of Tia's tale, though, is that the man who murdered her parents was once considered a family friend. In 2009, one of the most devastating auto accidents in New York State history occurred on the Tacoma State Parkway. Diane Schuler had just left the campground she'd been vacationing at with her family and was heading back to her home in Long Island. It was a drive she'd made dozens of times before, but four hours later, she would be spotted driving full speed down the highway in the wrong direction. It was a tragedy of unmatched capacity with multiple lives lost, and the question still remains over a decade later. What was wrong with Aunt Diane? On the afternoon of July 26, 2009, Warren Hance saw he had an incoming call from his 36-year-old sister, Diane Schuler. Diane had taken his three daughters along with her own family on a camping trip, and that morning they were scheduled to drive back home. When he answered, he was surprised when he didn't hear his sister's voice on the other end. Instead, the voice belonged to his eight-year-old daughter, Emma, who sounded panicked. Emma worriedly explained to her dad that Aunt Diane was having trouble seeing while driving and she wasn't speaking clearly. Eventually, Diane got on the phone and said she was feeling disoriented and had foggy vision. Warren could hear his sister slurring and immediately knew something was wrong. He told Diane to pull over and stay off the road and that he would drive out to her and help them. But when Warren got to the spot where Diane said she'd pulled over, she was gone and the unimaginable was about to happen. So the area where Diane had been driving was called Westchester County. Westchester had a pretty decent driving record and hadn't seen a major vehicle accident since the 30s when a bus veered off an embankment and took 20 lives. Unfortunately, that 75-year streak of good luck was about to come to an end that day. But let's go back to the morning of the 26th. Diane Schuler had been camping at the Hunter Lake Campground in Parksville, New York for the weekend with her husband Daniel, their two children, and her three nieces. On the morning of July 26, the family had woken up and got ready to head home. Diane left with her minivan around 9 a.m. with all of the children in tow. Piled in the van was her five-year-old son, Brian, her two-year-old daughter, Erin, and her three nieces, eight-year-old Emma, seven-year-old Allison, and five-year-old Kate. 
The group was squashed into her brother Warren's red Ford minivan, while her husband Daniel followed behind in a truck with the family dog. For the most part, the road trip had started off without a hitch. They did their various road trip traditions of stopping at McDonald's for breakfast, as well as their usual gas stations for potty breaks and snacks. As the minivan made its way down the New York Thruway, Diane called her brother to let him know that traffic was getting bad and they'd be getting home later than they expected. But while Diane was reporting heavy traffic, other drivers along the New York Thruway were calling 911 to report some troubling things they were seeing. Several eyewitnesses reported that a woman in a red minivan was driving aggressively, tailgating other cars, flashing their lights, honking their horn, and literally driving in between the two lanes to speed around people. Some witnesses also reported that they'd allegedly seen a woman with a red minivan pulled over on the side of the road. They said it looked like she was on her hands and knees and appeared to be getting violently sick. Shortly after that first phone call with her brother where she said they'd be home late, Diane made it across the Tappan Zee Bridge and onto the Taconic State Parkway. Two hours later, around 1 p.m., Warren would receive the worried call from Emma where she would tell him the infamous phrase, there's something wrong with Aunt Diane. This would become the title of the documentary about the case, which put Diane's life under a microscope to be examined as a possible explanation behind those final hours of what happened that day. Panicked, he called Diane's phone multiple times but never got a response. Diane had either accidentally or intentionally left her phone on the side of the road near the rest stop. After that, everything we know is pieced together from eyewitness accounts and evidence because no one would be able to contact anyone in the van to figure out exactly what was going on. At around 1.33, 911 operators received multiple calls about a minivan driving the wrong way up an exit ramp and onto the highway. Within minutes, operators received more worried calls reporting a similar van driving down the highway in the wrong direction, going around 80 miles an hour. For about two miles, Diane's van sped south on the northbound side of the parkway while cars swerved to avoid her before she eventually collided head on with a Chevrolet Trailblazer. In a matter of three minutes, eight lives were lost, with four of them being children. Of the 11 people involved in the crash, seven victims were pronounced DOA at the scene. Another victim would later succumb to their injuries at the hospital, bringing the total fatality count to eight. It was determined that the children in the back seat of the car were not buckled in their car seats properly. All three passengers in the car that Diane collided with unfortunately did not survive the impact either. Miraculously, the two passengers in the third car that was hit only suffered minor injuries. Diane's five-year-old son, Brian, as well as one of her nieces, initially made it out of the crash alive. But sadly, Diane's third niece did not pull through and succumbed to her injuries at the hospital. Brian suffered severe head trauma and broken bones and was the only survivor from the minivan, but he remembered nothing from the accident. The first people on the scene of the crash were the drivers who witnessed the accident. As soon as it happened, they jumped out of their cars and rushed to help, pulling Diane and all of the kids out of the van. Witnesses claim that as Diane was being pulled out, they could see a large broken bottle of vodka on the floor of the driver's side. Nine days after the crash, the investigation determined that Diane had been heavily intoxicated at the time of the crash. Toxicology reported that her BAC level was at 0.19%, nearly double the legal limit. That's around 10 drinks worth and nearing blackout status. Another six grams of alcohol was sitting in her stomach still yet to be absorbed. The toxicology report made authorities believe that Diane had been drinking from the bottle that was found in the car before the crash. They also discovered that Diane had high levels of THC in her system. The levels suggested that she could have as close to 15 minutes before she crashed the van. We'll never know anything that happened in that car for those last few terrifying minutes on the road. Most importantly, we'll never know the answer to the question that still baffles people to this day. Why? Why would she do that? The reports of the substances in Diane's system lined up pretty well with the eyewitness accounts of Diane on the road. Her erratic driving, pulling over to be sick, 
and inability to think and see clearly all pointed to dangerous levels of intoxication. But despite the overwhelming evidence that pointed to a DUI, Diane's family insisted there must have been some mistake. Diane was described as a PTA supermom, and she would never do anything to intentionally endanger the life of her kids. Daniel said she didn't even drink during the whole trip, and drinking that much was not like Diane. And other people backed him up too. Several employees who'd interacted with Diane along the various stops on her trip supported Daniel's claims. One employee even said they had a long and coherent conversation with Diane while she waited for her order. So if she really was sober during those parts of the day, that would mean that she had to have started pounding the booze after she'd made these stops. One theory that started to develop was that Diane was self-medicating because she had a bad toothache. She was allegedly seen rubbing her jaw periodically throughout the day and complaining of pain. At one of the gas stations, Diane had attempted to buy some Tylenol. The employee also said that Diane seemed totally fine when she was there and didn't appear to be wasted or high. Could her pain have just been so terrible that she was desperate for any sort of relief and she thought a slight buzz could help get her home? While her husband, Daniel, had initially claimed that Diane hadn't had anything to drink over the weekend, he eventually gave in and admitted that she might have had a little to drink at some points during the trip. He also said that Diane did smoke MJ occasionally, but it was never an extreme amount, claiming it was only to help her sleep at night. Daniel's sister later claimed that Diane smoked on a pretty regular basis. As hard as her family fought, they couldn't stop the investigators from ruling the crash a homicide from negligent driving. As a result of the crash and its high level of publicity, the governor of New York, David Patterson, introduced the Child Passenger Protection Act. The act made it a felony to drive under the influence while children under the age of 16 are present in the car. The private investigator that Daniel hired also thought the story was suspicious. He said he refused to believe that the PTA mom of the year just woke up one morning and decided to end it all. A lot of people believe that Diane was a mom who was struggling with addiction, and drinking was how she coped with stress. Diane had a traumatic childhood growing up. Her mother passed away when she was nine years old, and being the oldest sibling, her dad expected her to step in as the mother of the household. She had to raise her younger siblings while cooking and cleaning, and that kind of pressure is a lot on a young developing brain. And as therapists continue to point out, the body keeps score. We hold on to and internalize trauma, and it shapes how we grow up and cope with obstacles and stress as adults. Diane also never got a break when it came to motherhood either. She and Daniel had opposite work schedules, which meant Diane was often the one caring for the kids while Daniel was away at work. Some people theorized that maybe she secretly resented Daniel, like how she'd resented her father for making her do all the work growing up. The autopsy also showed that her liver didn't indicate any signs of being a long-term drinker, so that didn't exactly support the theory that she was a high-functioning drinker in secret. Which leads some people to this next theory. Maybe she had a mental breakdown. Was it possible the picture-perfect PTA mom was under so much stress to fit the mold that she suddenly snapped? As you can see, there's no way we will ever know with 100% certainty what it was that caused one of the most catastrophic accidents in Westchester County history. Today is a two for one because we'll be talking about two criminal cases, Curtis Dean Anderson Sr. and his son, Curtis Dean Anderson Jr. On a warm August day in 2000, eight-year-old Midsy Sanchez was walking home from school, elementary school in Vallejo, California. She was headed home alone, but that wasn't a big deal because she lived in the area and Midsy was having a birthday party that weekend. So she was super excited to get home. Near the end of Mitzi's walk, she noticed a middle-aged man sitting in his car looking at her through his rear-view mirror. This man was none other than Curtis Dean Anderson Sr. Mitzi had an uneasy feeling about Curtis. Something inside of her was telling her to cross the street. 
but before she could pass him, Curtis got out of his car and asked Mitzi to help him patch up his window. Genuinely thinking that this man needed help, Mitzi agreed. Curtis asked her to reach into his car and grab a roll of duct tape on the floor. And as soon as she bent over, Curtis came up behind her and covered her mouth. And at that moment, Mitzi knew the gut feeling she had was right. This man was a creep and was clearly going to do something bad to her. She tried to scream to alert neighbors, but no one would, could even hear her because Curtis muffled her voice. He then forced her into the car, chained her ankles to the gear shift, and then drove off. One of the craziest details about this case is that Curtis actually drove by Mitzi's house once he abducted her. And Mitzi could literally see her mom getting things ready for her birthday party, which broke her heart because she knew she wouldn't be able to be there. Instead, she was in the scary man's car against her will with millions of terrifying thoughts running through her head. Now, at one point, Curtis pulled over at a shopping center parking lot where he made her change clothes. The creepiest part about this is Curtis actually had clothes for Mitzi to change into, which makes me think he'd been watching her and planning the abduction for quite some time. And at the end of the night, he stopped at a rest stop where he forced himself on Mitzi before putting a chain around her feet and locking it with the padlock. For the next two days, Curtis drove around California with Mitzi inside. Of course, no one could see her because Curtis covered the windows with blankets, and no one could hear her because Curtis threatened to execute her if she screamed. To make matters even worse, Curtis never gave Mitzi food during this period. But here's where things took a turn. So one time when Curtis left Mitzi alone in the car, he also left a set of keys inside. Those keys belonged to the padlock that restrained Mitzi. And when she realized that, it was go time. Mitzi snatched up the keys, unlocked the padlock, escaped through a car window, and she ran for her freaking life. Curtis saw Mitzi and shouted for her to come back. Mitzi didn't follow for Curtis's b BS this time and just kept running. She frantically waved at a semi-truck driver approaching her who stopped to help. She told the truck driver, Carl, my name's Mitzi Sanchez, I've been kidnapped. Now Carl wasn't supposed to work that day, but agreed to pick up an extra shift. And thank God he did because Carl called for help, ultimately leading Mitzi to safety. Miraculously, she survived the abduction and she was reunited with her family. As for Curtis, he was caught by the police and then arrested for the crime. Unfortunately, Mitzi had a tough transition back to normal life. Her story was blasted on the news, so all of her classmates and friends inundated her with questions about a trauma she was reliving over and over and over again. At the age of 16, Mitzi got into a bad car accident which sent her to the hospital. And it was there that Mitzi found out that she was pregnant. Yeah, all these things happened to Mitzi before she even turned 17. Isn't that awful? But Mitzi's pregnancies encouraged her to get back to therapy and turn her life around. So now she's almost 30 years old and he's giving back to the families of missing children cases through her organization called the Mitzi Sanchez Foundation. A lot of her efforts were inspired by the difference Mitzi's case made in the lives of many other people who lost their children at the hands of Curtis Dean Anderson. That's right, people. Mitzi's abduction wasn't Curtis's first major crime, and Mitzi wasn't his first victim. Curtis eventually confessed to 10 murders, eight in the US and two in Mexico. Most of his victims were young women in their teens and 20s, but they hadn't had all been ID'd yet. Here's what we know for sure. The first victim was an unidentified young female runaway who Curtis murdered and dumped at a swimming hole in 1984. The second victim was an unidentified teenage hitchhiker who Curtis picked up and killed just days after the first girl. The third victim was a teenage girl who Curtis offed in 1985. The fourth victim was a 21 year old black woman who Curtis met at a bar. He killed her and got rid of her body in Oakland Hills. The fifth victim we have a name for, Amber Schwartz Garcia. She was only seven years old when she disappeared. Curtis saw her jumping rope on a street in NorCal in 1988 and decided to pounce. He abducted Amber and sedated her while he drove to Arizona to visit his aunt. Curtis reportedly murdered Amber at a motel in Tucson, then drove about 50 miles to dispose of her body. This case was a big deal because Amber was labeled missing for over 20 years. When Curtis was finally arrested for Mitzi's case, he confessed to offing Amber. The sixth victim was a Native American woman in her early 20s. Curtis claimed to have picked her up right outside of a bar in the Bay Area in 1988 or 89. But like Amber, Curtis took this woman to Arizona where he offed her. The seventh victim also has a name, Rosie Anderson. She was a woman of color in her early 20s, apparently with track marks all over her arm. Curtis met Rosie at a bar in San Jose. He murdered her and dumped her body in Santa Cruz. 
And the eighth and final victim that we know of was seven-year-old Ziana Fairchild. Her case was a big deal, so I'll give you some more information. Ziana disappeared on December 9th of 1999 on her way to school. She was quickly reported missing, but the authorities weren't able to find her anywhere. A year after Ziana vanishes was when Curtis was arrested for Mitzi's abduction. And that's when he boasted to reporters that he killed Ziana. But Curtis seemed to be like the kind of guy to lie and then brag about slaying people just to get more attention. Which is why some of the previous victims I told you about might not be true. Most of that information was from Curtis's confession to the cops. So take it with a grain of salt. All that to say, some people didn't necessarily believe Curtis when he said he had abducted and executed Ziana and disposed of her body down an embankment. Because he was so wishy-washy with his stories all the time, changing them frequently, for a while he was telling everyone that Ziana was still alive. And this got the attention of Ziana's great aunt, Stephanie. Stephanie received several letters from Curtis and even visited him in prison where he was serving time for Mitzi's crime already. Stephanie told the media, he would write to my post office box, just his own crazy mentally ill mind, basically tormenting and saying she would be hurt. It's so sad because Curtis got Stephanie's hopes up to the point that she bought Ziana's new clothes and packed her a bag for their reunion. But in January 2001, a construction worker found a partial skull on a rural road in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and it was a match for Ziana. Poor Stephanie was just trying to figure out what happened to Ziana and Curtis kept toying with her emotions. On top of that, once Curtis was outed, he claimed to have recorded himself harming Ziana, which he also threatened to release, like the sicko that he is. Well, eventually, prosecutors built a solid case against Curtis, because believe it or not, you can't convict a criminal known for lying with just a back and forth confession. Thankfully, prosecutors were able to find a few witnesses and gather more incriminating information, like the fact that Ziana's path to the bus stop fell along Curtis's cab route. He was a cab driver, by the way. With that, Curtis was charged with a crime in 2005. He first pleaded not guilty, but later switched to a guilty plea. He said, and I quote, she's dead, it's the end. Is there a difference between a young girl and a 40 year old woman who is dead? Dead is dead. But thankfully, Curtis was already in jail for Mitzi's case, for which he had received a 251 year sentence. So what's another 50 years to life? Curtis passed away in December of 2007 at the age of 46. The cause was natural causes due to a medical condition that wasn't released to the public. Anyway, as you can tell, Curtis was a terrible person and one who definitely should not have had children. But alas, the man had a child. His name, Curtis Dean Anderson Jr. Only narcissists give their children their exact name. Anyway, I don't really know much about Curtis Jr.'s upbringing, but what I do know is that he found himself in trouble with the law, just like his pops. And on the same day that Curtis Sr. pleaded guilty to Ziana's case, the Richmond, California Police Department announced Curtis Jr. as the prime suspect in the shooting of 31-year-old Vance Fisher. Here are some more details about the crime. At 3 a.m. on November 26 of 2005, police officers responded to 911 callers who reported hearing gunfire in the neighborhood. When the cops arrived at the scene, they found Vance's body on the ground near a garage of someone's home Vance was apparently visiting. A red Honda and a green station wagon were seen driving away from the scene of the crime. When I think this is how connected Curtis Jr. and his two accomplices to the scene, the cops found Curtis Jr. and he was later charged and found guilty of voluntary manslaughter in 2006. For that, he received a 16 year sentence, which is a little short if you ask me. Curtis Jr. would have been eligible for parole in 2023, but he received another three years for threatening a correctional officer. But Curtis Jr. would never live to see his parole date because on the morning of January 21st, 2019, he was discovered hanging in his prison cell. It took seven months for the medical examiner to officially rule Curtis's Jr. passing as self-harm. Now, I don't know if seven months is the typical turnaround for this kind of thing, but it seems a bit long, right? And one of Curtis's relatives made a public statement that she didn't think Curtis hung himself. But the examiner's report said Curtis was alone in his cell with no suspicious circumstances. And of course, if you look back at Curtis Sr.'s father, he was violent and abusive, so these genetics don't seem to be working in the Anderson's favor. That's mostly a joke, obviously. There are many other layers and factors that make people commit crimes like these, but parents and upbringing definitely play a major role in most criminal stories. Well, I think that's all the Anderson drama that I have for you today. Do you think that Curtis Sr. really executed all those victims he claimed he did? Or were some of them made up just for clout? And do you think his son would have gone on to become a criminal if his dad weren't an infamous pedophile and serial killer? Let me know in the comments. 
I'm Mac. Thanks for watching Killer Bytes. Sherry Papini's kidnapping case, or should I say alleged kidnapping case, is one of the most controversial and widely debated cases in California history. Was it a senseless crime with no real motive? Did her captors have a change of heart? Or was it all an act from a woman who needed just a little bit of attention? In today's episode, we're going to closely examine the details and conspiracy theories surrounding Sherry's case, and you can decide for yourself what you really think went down. Let's jump in. So Sherry Papini was this cute little blonde gal living her life in Northern California with her husband Keith and two young kids. On November 2nd, 2016, 34 year old Sherry went for a jog about a mile away from her home in Redding. Sherry disappeared and was missing for 22 whole days until she showed up 150 miles away, frantic, wide-eyed, and running along the interstate. She was found completely emaciated, weighing only 87 pounds. She was battered and bruised. A chain was around her waist with her left arm attached to it with a zip tie, and her famous blonde locks had been chopped off. The case garnered a ton of media attention, and people needed to know all the details so they could speculate to their heart's content. So here's the established timeline of events, according to Sherry, Keith, and the evidence. So on November 2nd, Sherry's husband Keith got home from his job at Best Buy around 6 p.m. and couldn't find Sherry or the kids. Obviously this was very unusual as Sherry was a stay-at-home mom, so he called the daycare and asked if she ever picked up the kids. The daycare informed him no. Sherry never came by and the kids were still there. Panicked, Keith used find my iPhone and located Sherry's phone with her headphones lying on a road a mile from their home. Before he picked it up though, he got the bright idea to take a picture of it for evidence since it looks suspicious. Never hurts to take a picture when it could be evidence later. Keith then reported Sherry missing and the case went viral with everyone and their mother out looking for Sherry. The authorities first looked into the people closest to Sherry beginning with Keith, but after a solid alibi and passing a polygraph test, the cops didn't believe Keith was behind it, so they continued with their large-scale manhunt. Little evidence was found until Thanksgiving Day when Sherry was discovered on the side of the highway at 4.30 in the morning, 150 miles away from home. But some people thought this Turkey Day miracle smelled a little fishy. The investigators thought so too, and they weren't sure what to believe when Sherry's husband went public with her side of the story. Sherry claimed that she had been taken by two Hispanic women and held hostage for the whole 22 days. What happened during those 22 days? We don't know exactly. The whole case has been kept very private for unknown reasons, but here are the very different facts that she'd given throughout the years. The women wore masks the whole time, so Sherry said that she never really knew what they actually looked like. She said that woman number one was young and the woman number two was old. Woman number one had curly hair with thin eyebrows and woman number two had straight hair with thick, bushy eyebrows. The police hired a sketch artist to do a rendering of the woman, but it was super vague because Sherry's details were in fact super vague. When the women weren't wearing masks, Sherry said they usually put a bag over her head. The same bag that Sherry used to attract the attention of the passerby on the highway by waving it through the air after she was allegedly shoved out of the moving car. She also said the woman only spoke in Spanish so she had no idea what was going on or where she was or she was even in a car. A dark SUV is all she remembered. And then for seemingly no reason, the woman just dropped her off at 4.30 in the morning on Thanksgiving day on the side of the road. Super weird, right? Other people thought so too and were quick to attack her online saying the whole thing was a hoax. As far as the police were concerned, they really couldn't commit it either way. The first strange character in the case that made people suspicious was this. Supposedly there was this anonymous donor who hired an expert hostage negotiator to make a YouTube video saying that a donor was offered a $50,000 reward for the return of Sherry. The negotiator pissed off police by interfering with their investigation and he eventually took down the video. The reward was never given out and no one knows who this random donor was. The strangest part about this is that the negotiator took down his video just one day before Sherry turned back up, which people found suspicious. Another detail that emerged that people thought looked staged was how Sherry's phone looked when it was discovered. Keith had called 911 and reported that he found his wife's phone a mile from their home in the grass after tracking it. And he was concerned because he said there were pieces of her hair in the wire headphones, almost like they had been forcibly ripped from her head in a struggle. But when you look at the picture, the headphones are neatly wrapped up on top of the phone and there aren't many visible strands of hair that you can detect with your naked eye. And just because there was some of her hair in the headphones doesn't necessarily mean it was ripped from her head. This led to a lot of people to believe that Keith was an accomplice in Sherry's story and that he could have placed her phone in the grass and taken a picture. A lot of people thought the couple was in on it to get fame and money and 
Some began withdrawing their donations from the GoFundMe set up to help Sherry and her family with bills, calling it a get-rich-quick scheme. Another deed that is highly unusual for this type of case is that the fact that Sherry claimed she was abducted by Hispanic women. As avid true crime fans, you're probably well aware of the fact that a female captor is possible, but highly unlikely. Experts reported how rare it was for a woman to nap another woman. They also mentioned it's super unusual for nappers to conceal their identities. Something else that didn't check out statistically was the fact that the women grabbed a 35-year-old woman. Most of the time, children and teens go missing, not adults. But of course, just because something isn't likely doesn't necessarily mean it's not possible. That's what a lot of people thought until a web sleuth would discover something even more incriminating about the Hispanic women aspect of the case. They were able to dig up some very racist and anti-Latino posts made in 2003 on a skinhead's blog by a woman with Sherry Papini's maiden name, Graf. In some articles penned by a woman named Sherry Graf, she talked about her pride for her white roots and heritage, how to properly be a good skinhead wife to your skinhead husband, and how she and her family have continuously stood up to Latinos in the past. What the hell? Sherry's father and husband denied that Sherry was the author of this blog and blamed it on punks, but the damage had already been done. Some people believed this further proved it was all a hoax, and that Sherry used this as another reason to villainize Latinos further with some even suggesting that she was trying to start a race war. Some other people believe that she was actually taken, but that Sherry just said it was by two Hispanic women because she's racist. And on top of that, some other web sleuths found Sherry's old Pinterest where she had a board titled Cultural Differences. And on that board, she would pinned some very pro-white posts. Another aspect of the case that doesn't make sense to people is the fact that after 22 days, her captors just randomly decided to release her. While it's not unheard of for victims to show back up later like Elizabeth Smart, it's very odd that no ransom money or motive was ever figured out. Why would two women just grab this mom who was out for a jog and then starve, beat, chain, and brand her to then just let her go after all that? And speaking of the branding, what's up with that? Sherry had a brand on her shoulder and the police said that they believed it'd be some sort of message, but it was done pretty terribly. It's not uncommon for traffickers to brand their victims with certain symbols that indicate things, but why would they put a potential identifying mark on this woman only to just let her go? The branding was actually a detail the investigators were hoping to keep private. Keith revealed that detail in an emotional interview for 2020, only a few days later after her reappearance. Some speculate that Keith Papini's interview on 2020 was too strange for a husband in grief and that he had something to do with her disappearance. Of course, it's impossible to tell how anyone would react in a stage of such immense shock and stress. And it very well could have been Keith's natural reaction to it all, but we won't really ever know for sure. The police tried not to be upset with Keith for revealing such a key detail in the investigation, but they couldn't blame him for trying to defend his wife under a harsh wave of accusation from the public. Keith went into great detail about his wife's emaciated body when he first saw her and how she had yellowing bruises from old wounds as well as fresh deep bruises and restraint marks that indicated weeks of torture. That's the thing about this case that always gets me is that when people fake their attacks, their wounds are always described as superficial and it's clear that they're self-inflicted. But with Sherry, it was very clear that she was in bad shape. Her nose was even broken. She had lost 15% of her body weight in 22 days. She had burns, cuts, and bruises. I just find it hard to believe that a person could actually do this to themselves, which of course led to even more interesting theories. Some people believe that Sherry was into substances and went on an all out bender for 22 days, which would explain the weight loss and injuries. However, Sherry is often described as super mom and the perfect mom in many articles and friends and to everyone who knew Sherry, her world revolved around her kids. She never swore, she was kind to everyone she met, and she lived a relatively quiet, humble life. Others believe that maybe the supermom had been living a double life, and maybe she'd spent the weeks away with a lover and was into some kinky activities that would result in the injuries. This was definitely an angle that the police were pursuing, and they discovered an alleged male acquaintance from Michigan. Some texts were found in Sherry's phone from some dude that was planning to meet up with Sherry just a few days before she disappeared, because he was coming to town for business, but they never found evidence to connect the guy to her disappearance. Remember that Pinterest account? Well, it turns out there was another board with a rather strange theme. This one was titled, 
alter ego and featured a lot of submissive housewife type posts. So at first, people thought the theory to be preposterous, but after seeing this board, their perspectives changed a little bit. And as it turned out though, Sherry's record wasn't necessarily as clean as everyone said it was. During the years of 2000 to 2003, her family made multiple calls to law enforcement regarding her mental health and some breakdowns she had had. In 2000, Sherry's dad called the cops on her when she robbed his house. Three years later, he alleged that she made unauthorized withdrawals from his bank account. And that same year, Sherry's mom called the police to report that Sherry had been harming herself and saying, that she had done it to her own daughter. There were also some Facebook allegations that were made by Pepini's in-laws that claimed Sherry had attempted to stage her own abduction in 2006. When police working the case still say that they have no reason to believe that her kidnapping was a hoax, some experts who have looked at the case say that a history of harming herself and blaming others sheds a different light on the case entirely. However, the experts maintain that just because there are odd details about a case, it doesn't mean straight up the whole thing was fabricated. So it's entirely possible that Sherry Papini is a real victim and has had to go through the unfortunate experience of her life being put under the microscope by the public to prove she's a liar. While Sherry may not be the perfect person everyone says she is, it doesn't necessarily prove that she would go all gone girl just for some attention. And besides, since the incident, Sherry has gone back to her private quiet life as a stay at home mom and neighbors say she hardly ever leaves the house anymore due to cameras and paparazzi constantly following her around. Wouldn't someone who did this for attention be absolutely loving her own personal camera crew following her around? To me, it seems this poor woman is just trying to pick up the pieces to continue living a life as normal as she can. As of now, Sherry has never appeared in public or gone to the media to speak about her ordeal. No arrests have ever been made in her case and no motive has ever been disclosed. So much of me immediately thinks it's suspicious and I start to believe that she faked it for attention, but when I hear about the injuries and the weight loss and the torture, how could she have done that to herself? I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching. In today's episode, we're gonna discuss the case of Christopher Foster and the horrific murders he committed. From the outside, Christopher Foster was living the dream. He had a beautiful family, a lavish home, nice cars, and money out the wazoo. What most people didn't know was that Chris was actually in millions of pounds of debt. On the morning of August 26, 2008, a crazy house fire was reported in Maysbrook, Shropshire, which is a town in England. It was the huge, fancy home of the Foster family. When police officers and firefighters arrived at the home, they weren't able to get to the house. There was a horse trailer blocking the gate, and it appeared that all of the tires had been deflated by bullets. It took them three days to put the fire out completely, and what they found on the property was absolutely horrendous. While taking photos of the crime scene, one of the officers stepped by something described as spongy. Turns out that spongy thing he stepped on was a pair of corpses. The officer stated they were revealed to have fallen through the burned floor from above while still entwined. The corpses belonged to 50-year-old Christopher and his 49-year-old wife, Jill. And not long after that, Christopher and Jill's 15-year-old daughter, Christy Foster, was also discovered inside the home. And all of the dogs, horses, ducks, and chickens were lifeless too, but not from the fire. They had been taken out with a firearm. It ended up taking seven days for all of the bodies to be removed from the scene. Autopsies were performed on all three family members, and the examiner concluded that Jill and Christy were executed in their sleep by Chris. Chris's COD was recorded as smoke inhalation, but he was found next to a loaded rifle, so some people believe he may have pointed it at himself and pulled the trigger. In reality, Chris was in a lot of financial trouble, and his business had gone down the toilet. Chris started out selling pizza in the 80s, but it wasn't long until he was a major player in the oil business. After the Piper Alpha oil platform explosion in 1987, which killed 167 men, Christopher pulled through with a grand idea for an oil rig sealant called OlvaShield. Chris patented OlvaShield, and due to its five-star safety rating, this product was in high demand. 
Chris's fortune skyrocketed, and before he knew it, he was a millionaire. Chris started dressing all nice and bought a million pound home Jill saw in a magazine. Chris claimed to have paid for the house in cash, but people later discovered it had been mortgaged multiple times. Something to know about Chris is he loved clay pigeon shooting and he was obsessed with firearms. He often misused the weapons in extremely concerning ways. Chris would fire at Jill's doves if they ever got in the garage because he didn't want them pooping on his cars. And he also offed Christie's Labrador Retriever with a rifle because it was chasing sheep. By 2005, Chris was reported to have acquired 2.8 million pounds of debt, but he didn't want to change his rich lifestyle. Instead, Chris decided to charge up his credit cards and change suppliers for Ulva Shield to save some coin for his company. In doing so, he breached the contract he had with the old supplier, who took him to court and won. Because of this, Chris's company was liquidated in 2007. He also hadn't been paying his taxes and owed over 800,000 pounds to the government. At least 20 of his bank accounts were overdrawn and he had apparently been cheating on his wife too. Reports say he had somewhere around eight mistresses. Chris apparently confessed to an employee that he was having suicidal thoughts. Because of that, he was prescribed antidepressants. At one point, Chris told a longtime friend named Mark about his financial situation. Chris said he didn't want to put this on Jill and Christy because he didn't think they'd be able to cope with it. Then Chris asked Mark to look after his wife and daughter because he was going to take his own life. Chris told Mark he was going to do the deed out in the woods with his shotgun, but somewhere along the way, that plan changed, I guess. What most people believe spurred Chris to pop off that August day was this. The family housekeeper found a letter on the outside gate. It was from bailiffs who announced plans to repossess all of Chris's belongings in the coming days. The housekeeper mentioned seeing Chris read the letter. She said he was silent, but looked absolutely distressed. On August 25th, 2008, the Fosters were invited to a barbecue and clay pigeon shoot. During their gathering, Chris was bragging about his 11 million pound deal he was about to secure, which was a lie, of course. The Fosters rode home in Jill's Range Rover, and it wasn't long before Jill went to bed. At 11.30 p.m., Chris told Christy to go to sleep. She apparently went back to her room and was chatting with a friend on the internet, so Chris then turned their internet off. But after that, we know quite a few details because the Foster's home security cameras were recording and the footage was all recovered. At 3.10, Chris was seen by the horse stable holding a 22 with a silencer and a light attached to it. Armed and ready, Chris started walking towards the house. There wasn't any footage from inside the home, but from what investigators gathered, this is when Chris went into his and Jill's bedroom and fired at his wife in the back of the head. Jill was believed to have been asleep when it happened. After that, Chris went across the hall to Christie's room and did the same thing to her in the same exact place. In addition, Chris iced all of the animals on the property in the same fashion with a bullet to the head. After that, he poured about 200 gallons of oil around the house and set it ablaze. Anyway, after the horrific mass execution, Chris drove the horse trailer in front of the gate and parked it there to block, or at least delay, first responders from entering the property. Chris took out the keys, shot out all of the tires, and ran back inside the home. When neighbors heard a loud sound, which was later revealed as Chris's cars exploding in the garage, they called 999, which is the emergency number in England. A lot of people described Chris as narcissistic and controlling. So with the downfall of his company and finances, a lot of people believe he committed this crime out of fear of failure and embarrassment. He didn't want people to know about his debt. As for Jill and Christy, a lot of commenters on the case believe he iced them because he didn't want them to find out either. Rumor has it, both Chris and Jill were cheating on one another. One person claimed they had an open marriage. So this could also be another reason Chris took out Jill. He didn't want her to be happy with another man. Or more like, he didn't want other people in town seeing Jill happy with another man. 
When details of the crime spread, the whole town was devastated. People left cards and flowers to honor the deceased. But Chris was looked down upon by most. Chris's brother, Andrew, was shocked, but not surprised. When they were children, Chris sexually assaulted Andrew, so they didn't keep in touch as adults. Andrew was heartbroken to hear about his brother's actions and said he wished his doctor had notified the police of Chris's suicidal thoughts, given the fact that he owned so many firearms. Andrew said, we wish to highlight that preventative measures such as improved communication between GPs, aka general practitioners, and police forces, firearms officers in the future could help stop a similar tragedy happening to another family. As for Chris's mom, she has forgiven Chris and still stands by him. Yeah. She literally said, he took their lives away and I know that was wrong, but I think he did it because he loved them. You always love your children, whatever they do. You can't cut off because they've done something horrible. I know what he did was horrible, but it just wasn't Chris. Newsflash, it was Chris. Here's where I pass it to you. What do you think of this case? And what do you think Chris's ultimate motive was? Let me know in the comments section and I'll see you next time on Killer Bites. Thanks for watching everyone. Eric Smith wasn't the most popular kid in school. He was often made fun of for his red hair, freckles, and glasses. Because of the bullying he endured, he carried a lot of anger with him. One summer day, as he was riding his bike home from the closed rec center, he saw a four-year-old little boy walking alone and immediately decided that was who he wanted to take his anger out on. He thought to himself, this is the perfect victim. Pathetic that he went after someone so defenseless. Was there any other reason for choosing a four-year-old besides him being small? Our story takes place in the small town of Savona, New York. It was a hot summer day in August of 1993, and four-year-old Derek Roby was on his way to the summer recreation program he'd been attending. Normally, his mom Doreen would take him, but she was busy with Derek's little brother. Since it was just a short walk down the same side of the street one block down, Derek told his mom he could walk by himself. He said, it's okay mom, I'll go by myself. You know, it's no problem, the kids are probably going down the street. Doreen agreed. This was the first time she'd ever let him walk alone. She handed Derek his lunch, he kissed her, they exchanged I love yous, and Derek was on his way. Shortly after that, it started to storm, so Doreen went to pick up Derek. When she arrived at the park where the rec program took place, she was told Derek never showed up that morning. That's when the panic set in. Doreen immediately called the police and began searching for her son. Many people joined in on the search, hoping to find Derek safe and sound. Sadly, a few hours later, that hope was crushed. Derek's body was found. The boy's corpse was hidden in the woods, several feet away from the park. Derek was found without shoes and covered in wounds, some of which were from heavy rocks being dropped on top of him. It also appeared that the boy had been with a stick. To make matters worse, the authorities found Kool-Aid in Derek's wounds. The perp must have gotten it from Derek's lunch bag, which was found ripped open, missing the Kool-Aid his mom had packed him. Derek's COD was later determined to be blunt trauma to the head with contributing asphyxia. When word got out about the homicide, the whole town of Savona freaked out. Not only were they heartbroken for Derek and his family, but they were scared that whoever did this wasn't done. Who were they going to attack next? At first, most everyone thought the perp was an out-of-towner, especially since the crime took place not too far from a major highway. Not to mention, everyone in Savona knew each other, and no one could imagine one of their own being able to do such cruel things to this innocent four-year-old boy, especially Derek, who was known by many as the unofficial mayor of Savona. He was an excellent T-ball player and an overall happy, outgoing kid. But it turns out the crime was committed by someone in town. About a week after the incident, the police had a confession from a 13-year-old boy named Eric Smith. Apparently, the night of the crime, Eric asked his friend Marlene what would happen if the perp turned out to be a kid. Marlene replied, I think they seriously need some psychiatric help. She thought it was a weird question to be asked, but it seemed completely hypothetical at that point. However, Marlene realized Eric went to that same park earlier in the day. What if he was the perp everyone was looking for? Marlene grew even more suspicious after she witnessed extremely weird behavior from Eric in the following days. Because of this, she called Eric's mom. Marlene and Eric's mom took Eric to the police station to meet with detectives. At first, Eric told the investigators he hadn't seen Derek that day, but gave a full confession shortly after. Eric said he was in a really bad mood that morning. He rode his bike to the rec program, but it wasn't open yet. This really upset him more than it should have. Full of rage, Eric saw four-year-old Derek walking by himself and decided to take his anger out on him. Eric approached the little boy and said he knew of a shortcut to get to the park. Derek followed his lead and that's how they ended up in the secluded wooded area. First, Eric said he strangled Derek. Then he dropped a 26-pound rock on his head and 
and with a stick. Eric said he believed the stick would reach Derek's heart and stop it from beating. As Eric was explaining this to the investigators, he said he enjoyed harming Derek and didn't want it to end. When asked why he did it, Eric said, I don't know. I just saw this kid, this blonde kid, and I wanted to hurt him. He also said he was tired of being bullied by other kids. Eric was often made fun of for his red hair, freckles, and big ears. His classmates also teased him for being a bit slow in school. Eric was fed up with being bullied and decided to become the bully himself. It's obviously extremely messed up that he was bullied, but it still gives him no reason to go and execute an innocent little boy. Eric went to trial in August of 1994. At this point, he was 14 years old, but was tried as an adult. It's so strange because Eric looks so young in all of the photos from his trial. Who would have ever imagined this freckled glasses wearing redhead would do such a terrible terrible thing. Because he had already confessed, this wasn't a very difficult case to solve. Prosecutor John Tunney presented everything known about this crime, including all of the disturbing details. John said he could have simply killed Derek, but he chose not to simply kill Derek. Eric continued to deal with Derek's body because he wanted to, because he chose to, and most frighteningly, because he enjoyed it. John believed Eric was a budding serial killer who would have acted out again had he not been arrested. The defense attorney said Eric's mom, Tammy, took anti-seizure and anti-depression meds when she was pregnant with Eric. They believed this mixture of medications gave Eric rage disorder, which is what they blamed his actions on, in addition to the intense bullying suffered by Eric. But no one was buying any of this. Eric seemed to be fully aware of his actions. He did have a bit of an interesting hobby, though, dressing up like a clown. This tidbit of information was revealed by Eric's grandparents, whom he liked to hang out with frequently. In the end, the jury found Eric guilty of second-degree murder, and he was sentenced to nine years to life in prison. Eric was sent straight to a juvenile facility where he stayed until 2001. After that, Eric Eric was moved to state prison. He was eligible for parole in 2002, but his request was denied. Every two years after that, Eric was eligible for parole, which he applied for each time. This was always very stressful for Derek's family, who obviously wanted their son's killer to stay in jail. They actually tried to push for legislation that would only grant violent felons the opportunity for parole every five years because it was painful to be reminded of the crime so frequently. Doreen said, it upsets me, the fact that we have to beg to keep this killer behind bars. They could decide that. Well, now he's done his time and we're going to let him go. It scares the hell out of me. At Eric's parole hearing in 2004, he told the board that he enjoyed throttling Derek. He said, instead of me being hurt, I was hurting somebody else. Eric also told the board that if he wasn't initially charged for the crime, he most likely would have gone after another victim. To no one's surprise, Eric was denied parole. But in October of 2021, after receiving 10 no's, Eric got a yes. He was officially granted parole. This came as a huge shock to the community, but Eric seemed to have really turned his life around in the past several years. He had gone through extensive therapy, which definitely helped him cope with his bullying and try to make amends for his actions. In a 2009 news interview, Eric said, My anger wasn't directed at Derek at all. It was directed at all the other guys that used to pick on me. And when I was torturing and killing Derek, that was what I saw in my head. Eric decided he wanted to become a counselor so he could help other kids who were bullied. He said, I want to get married and raise a family, hold down a job, pursue the American dream. He admitted to killing Derek and understood why the victim's family didn't want him to be set free. He also read this apology letter. I know my actions have caused a terrible loss in the Roby family. And for that, I am truly sorry. I've tried to think as much as possible about what Derek will never experience. His 16th birthday, Christmas, owning his own house, graduating, going to college, getting married, his first child. If I could go back in time, I would switch places with Derek and endure all the pain I've caused him. If it meant that he would go on living, I would switch places, but I can't. But after giving all these moving interview answers, Eric remained in prison for 12 more years. He said he knew he would be released someday and at age 41, that day came. At his parole hearing, Eric told the board that he's learned coping mechanisms for his anger and now understood the value of human life. He said that God called on him to get into ministry, which led him to take college classes in jail, earning his degree in evangelism. He also spoke about plans to get a job as a carpenter or electrician. The most surprising thing for me to hear was that Eric has a fiance, and it wasn't a fellow inmate. Some woman who was working on becoming a lawyer had some questions about the juvenile system. So she wrote a letter to Eric to ask a few questions. He wrote her back, and then she wrote him again, and so on and so forth. Somewhere along the way, the two fell in love with each other and decided to get married. Eric told the parole board that he was excited to start a new life with this woman and was no longer a menace to society. He said, the 13 year old kid that took Derek's life is not the man sitting in front of you talking. If you were to give me the chance, I would not only prove that I am not a threat, I would definitely be an asset to society. The board was moved by Eric's newfound attitude. 
They also recognized that Eric only had three citations for disciplinary issues, all before 2005. Because of this, they granted him parole. He was ordered to remain in the state of New York, keep in close contact with his parole officer, stay away from people who participate in illegal activities, and is never allowed to own firearms. After word got out, the people of Savona held a candlelight vigil and a march for Derek. They peacefully protested the release of Eric Smith and made it clear that they did not want him back in Savona. Most people believe that's where he would go since his mom still lived there. Surprisingly enough, Derek's family took this news as well as they could have. Doreen said, I understand why after so many years they decided to give him a chance. And that's fine, you know, for him and his family. You know, he's been released, but in a way, so have we. No more parole. I can get on with our lives. Now the true healing can begin. Eric was officially released in February of 2022. At this point, he was 42 and served 28 years in jail. The reason it took a few months for Eric to get released is that he had to find approved housing. He found a spot in Queens, New York, which is where he lives now. Eric said he chose to live there because he didn't want to go back to Savona. Clearly no one wanted him there and it also would have been even harder for Derek's family. Imagine going to a restaurant in town and seeing the man who took your son's life. Doreen said in an interview, I don't let him take space in my head. I do not focus on where he is, what he's doing because I don't care as long as he's not near friends and family. Every anniversary following the day Derek passed, Doreen and her family always try to go out and do something fun to keep their mind off of things. Derek loved vanilla ice cream, or as he called it, white ice cream with sprinkles. So they go out and get some on August 2nd every year. The hope of the Roby family and everyone in Savona is for Derek to be remembered for the positives. He was a bright, bubbly little boy that was loved by many. He truly deserved to live a full life and no apology Eric can give will make up for that. As for Eric, it's unfortunate he was bullied so much in his life Life, and reports also mention him experiencing an abusive childhood. It's sad he had to go through that, but even more sad he resorted to violence as a coping mechanism. I really hope he has changed for the better and doesn't blow this second chance at life. And there you have it. The tragic story of how Derek Roby lost his life at the hands of 13-year-old Eric Smith. What do you all think about the outcome of this case? Do you think Eric should have been set free? Or do you believe he should still be in jail for life? I'm a bit conflicted, but I'm very curious to hear if he ends up marrying that lawyer lady. What an interesting couple they make. Anyway, that's all for today. I'm Allie, and thanks for watching Killer Bites. Thirty-four-year-old Paige Bergfeld was a mom whose whole life revolved around her kids. And when days passed with no sign of her, some mysterious clues started popping up that would turn the whole case on its head. Paige was living a double life unknown even to the people closest to her. Paige was a single mom and had become the sole caregiver for her kids. When Paige seemingly vanished into thin air, the police knew she did not leave on her own terms. And the authorities started the investigation the usual way by first looking at the people closest to Paige. Well, naturally, a history of divorce the year before piqued their interest. But when they learned that she had not one, but two ex-husbands, they started to get curious. So her first husband was her high school sweetheart, I guess, and the guy's name is Ron Bagler. According to Paige's dad, Ron was Paige's first big love, and they'd actually reconnected recently and started dating again in the past few months. According to Paige's sister-in-law, Callie, Paige was super stoked about rekindling the romance nearly 10 years later. Ron Bagler became the main focus of the investigation, especially when they learned that he had been with Paige the day she went missing. Well, apparently they'd been on a picnic date at a rest stop that was right around the halfway point between their homes since they lived four hours away from each other. But the things we do for love, am I right? Well, Paige drove home later that night around nine o'clock and Ron said they chatted on the phone for a little and she told him she'd call him tomorrow. No, you hang up first. No, you hang up first. Cell phone records confirmed that Paige did call Ron around 9 p.m. and her location showed that she was only a few miles away from her home. Little did she know that this phone call would be one of her last. Paige, of course, would never call him back. She was only a few miles away from her home where her kids were waiting for her. She was so close. So Ron tried calling Paige the next day, but it went straight to her voicemail. So either the phone had turned off or the battery had died. Two days after he'd last heard from Paige, Ron finally tried calling her home phone. Paige's live-in nanny, who was also taking care of her three children, told Ron that Paige hadn't been home since Thursday night, the night of their date. After that, he called the sheriff's office and then Paige's parents. Ironically though, Ron would become the first person that the police wanted to question. Although Ron was the last person to see and speak with Paige, everyone who knew him believed he had nothing to do with her disappearance. They were really adamant that he'd be the last person who'd want to harm her. And on top of that, he was also having a really hard time emotionally coping. 
So there was reason to suspect he was telling the truth. Page's family said when they spoke to Ron on the phone, he sounded absolutely beside himself with grief. And he couldn't get through a sentence without choking up with tears. So they believed him. I mean, they have known the guy technically since he was in high school, so he'd probably have to be a pretty good actor to be fooling everyone if he was guilty. So after determining Ron's innocence, the investigators started going down a different path, which led them to suspect number two. When asked if anyone might have wanted to harm Paige, her friends said yes, Rob Dixon, her second husband and the father of her children. So just to clarify, we have Ron Bagler, Paige's first husband and most recent boyfriend, and Rob Dixon, Paige's second husband and now ex. Well, apparently Rob had quite the history with Paige. Some described their relationship as explosive and troubled, which is 2007 speak for what we call toxic. While the police started looking into Rob, Paige's family knew they were losing time and they had to just start looking somewhere if they ever wanted to find her. So they decided to split up in different directions to cover more ground. Anyway, a bunch of volunteers gathered to search as well and Frank became the leader of the group, reminding everyone to keep their eyes open for anything. The investigation into Page's past by the police pressed on while the massive manhunt maneuvered its way through the mainland. Specialty divers combed through the mud in the murky river and found nothing. Finally, they got their first big lead on Sunday, July 1st, around 10 p.m., when a 911 call came in from a woman reporting that she saw a car on fire in a parking lot. Well, it turned out to be Paige's car, the one she drove on the night she vanished. Paige's red Ford Focus that was only two miles away from her home had completely burnt to a crisp in an empty parking lot. So by the next morning, they'd already been able to figure out that the fire was started from inside the car on the passenger side seat. To the investigators, this meant that whoever started the fire was smart enough to completely destroy any potential evidence inside the car that could lead to him. But the perp did make one mistake. When the car was found, the driver's seat had been pushed all the way back, which told them that someone very tall had probably driven the car at least over six feet tall. While the Bergfeld family was terrified about what the car meant for the fate of Paige, the police continued zeroing in on their second suspect. The investigators had learned a few things about her history with her second husband, Rob Dixon. So back in 1997, when Paige met Rob, he was apparently a total catch. He and his dad had invested into a business venture that ended up becoming a huge success, and this caused their family to become very wealthy, which some people say changed Rob as a person. So Paige and Rob began a whirlwind relationship that moved lightning fast. And only a year after they met, they had a wedding, and started their family together. I mean, that is fast. The family moved to Grand Junction into a house that they were able to do some renovations on, and they did their best to make it a home. But apparently, Dixon lived a very expensive lifestyle from his one-time financial success and hadn't learned how to responsibly handle his money. His funds were starting to dry out, and he began investing his remaining finances in more reckless investments. So he starts investing millions of dollars into these business ideas that were really risky, and the bills were piling up. Paige started to get really stressed out about them being able to provide for their kids, so she pitched in as best as she could. She started this adorable little preschool dance business where she'd teach classes and hold recitals that she'd even hand make the costumes for. Well, when that wasn't enough, she turned to what most middle-aged housewives do, sell for a multi-level marketing company. <laughs> Which particular flavor of poison did she pick? pampered chef. But Paige, who wouldn't give up on wanting a good life for her kids, became one of the few successful sales agents of the company and earned a free trip to the Caribbean. Even still, Rob was apparently losing money way faster than Paige was making it, and within a few years, all of his investments had fallen through, and he'd pretty much lost everything. Paige's brother Craig said their financial struggles put a ton of pressure on their relationship, and it really caused some problems in their marriage, which at this point had taken a turn for the worse. Paige's family had also found these online message boards where Paige would write entries about her husband, sometimes almost like a journal, and the tea was piping hot. She wrote entries that talked about fearing for her life and her children asking if their dad was going to hurt her. This was only three months before she disappeared. Then police found out that in October of 2004, Paige called 911 for help after a nasty fight with Rob. 
She said that her husband threatened the lives of her children, and he said that she'd come home to find their bodies. I mean, what the hell is going on? That is really concerning. Well, the situation diffused by the time the police and media arrived, but no charges were filed. The couple divorced in 2006, and Rob declared bankruptcy and was living in Philadelphia, which is exactly where he said he was the night Paige disappeared in Philadelphia, 2,000 miles away. I mean, wait, what? He was really starting to sound like our guy. But investigators concluded that Rob's alibi held up. So the family had to believe he was where he said he was that night. So now what? Well, after a few weeks had passed, some search volunteers found some of Paige's personal things, including her checkbook, scattered along the highway, 15 miles from where the flaming car was discovered. And soon after, the police found some shocking information on Paige's computer and day planner that would turn her family's world upside down. Paige had been living a double life as an adult She'd kept this entire part of her life a secret from every single person she knew, including her family, and they were all completely shocked. In provocative ads on the internet as a high price named Carrie, this was the point in the investigation where everything changed. You got that right. Paige's family was distraught to learn about her secret life and could hardly believe what they were seeing, but they were certain the only reason she'd turned to this profession was for her children. She had three kids and the pressure of being the perfect mom and having to be the breadstick winner? I mean, that's a lot. I don't know how these single moms do it. Also, her husband only paid her $500 a month in child support, but her mortgage was like $6,000 a month. Her brother said it never really did make sense to him how Paige was able to afford her mortgage for more than a couple of months, but now it all clicked. At that point, the investigators had a hunch that Paige met her fatal end at the hands of one of her clients. So they searched Paige's phone and finally caught a lucky break. On the day she went missing, the last call she made was to Ron around 9 p.m., but she also had received several calls from a client of <laughs> Inc. Three calls had come in from a guy who called himself Jim and asked if Carrie was available that evening, and then he called again that night. All the calls were made from a prepaid track phone, so police traced the number to a Walmart where it had been bought two days earlier by a man captured on candid camera. Ashton Kutcher, yo, come out here, you big kook, okay? The detectives were finally able to find out that Jim was this guy named Lester Jones, and Lester Jones just so happened to work right across the street from where Paige's burning car was found. Ugh. I mean, the name just gives me the shivers, Lester Jones. The track phone's entire history consisted of only five calls. The first four were him calling Paige on the <laughs> ink line. Then Paige called the track phone back that night from her <laughs> ink phone. After that, the track phone's battery died and never made another call again. Oh, good. Lay that thing to rest, just chuck it in the sea. When they do a little digging, they find out that Jones had some jail time under his belt for lewd actions and that he was six foot five, the kind of guy who would drive with a car seat pushed all the way back. While one detective grilled Lester in the interrogation room, some police officers searched his workplace, while a few others had a little chat with his wife. Wait, wife? You mean to tell me this was able to lock down a honey? Oh, no, 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 I don't think so. Apparently, Lester's wife was out of town the night Paige went missing, and the night when Paige's car was found burning, Lester confessed that he had left the house Sunday night between 9 and 10 p.m. for a thing at work. Wait, so you're telling me that Lester suddenly has a work thing the same time the Ford Focus is found burning up like a Jonas brother? Yeah, I don't think so. Speaking of his work, they searched the RV shop where he worked and found some dirty laundry. There were a bunch of handwritten notes about other courts in the area and intimate details about them down to their measurements, what their hair color was, and what they would and wouldn't do. Oh, Lester, you're such a Oh, and they also found the track phone packaging for the phone he bought, as well as a food scale from the good old pampered chef tucked away in his office. Yeah, I don't really get the feeling that Lester was using that scale to measure fruits and veggies, right? But Lester continued to deny any involvement in Paige's disappearance, and even went so far as to say it's not him in the surveillance video buying the phone in his second interrogation. He first denied being at the Walmart at all, and then said he went in there to buy a soda. Well then, tracker dogs were taken to Paige's car 
and they signal that they pick up the scent of Lester Jones in the front seat. But Lester said he'd never been anywhere with her. But just because there was all this evidence didn't mean it was proof. Could they prove without a doubt that Lester Jones was responsible for Paige Bergfeld's disappearance? Only one key piece of evidence was left that would allow convicted felon Lester Jones to remain free. They couldn't find a body. But four years later, in the spring of 2012, a hiker stumbled upon some skeletal remains in the dry creek bed, 60 miles south of where Paige's personal things had been found scattered along the highway. Across the mile-long stretch of the creek, forensic scientists found more bones that they quickly determined belonged to Paige Bergfeld. They could piece together through the evidence that Paige had been taken against her will and that Lester Jones is the only person who could have done it because of his history of assault, his shoddy alibi, his history with Paige as a client, the calls on his burner phone, and his work location being across the street from where the car was found. After years of not knowing, Paige's family finally had some answers. But in September 2016, Lester caught a break when the jury couldn't reach a verdict, so the case had to be retried. And in November of 2016, after five long, brutal weeks, the moment Paige's family had been waiting nine and a half years for finally happened. Lester Jones was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Dang, I mean, nine and a half years with no answers. This one is such a wild story to think that someone can actually successfully live a double life without even their closest friends knowing is an impressive feat. But through all of these stories, we find out that apparently people get away with it all the time. It's just so sad to me that Paige felt she had no other options and had to turn to a riskier profession in order to provide for her kids. Well, 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 look who it is. Welcome back to Killer Bites, you true crime junkie. This show isn't like most shows. No, no, it's super cool. We talk about true crime cases in the kitchen. Sometimes we cook, sometimes we don't. Today I'm gonna to be telling you all about the Eastburn family murders. In this case, the killer almost got away with it. Only a few things get me more pumped up than an unsolved case being solved. Well, what if I told you that a murder of an entire family carried out by a sergeant in the army had gone cold for over 20 years before it was solved? What is done in the dark will always come to light. So for any horrible murderers out there that haven't been caught yet, we're gonna get you. Let's start at the very beginning. This story starts off with a little bit of love. Love at first sight, the best kind. Gary and Katie Eastburn met each other in the early 1970s. Katie grew up in Kansas and met Gary at a softball game. In an instant, the spark started to fly. When you know, you know. Gary and Katie didn't jump into anything too quickly though. They dated for five years until they were sure they were ready to get married. We love a couple that thinks through important decisions. Good for you. And in 1975, they finally tied the knot. They went on to have three children together. Kara, who was five years old, Aaron, who was three, and Jaina, who was almost two. Gary was sent to Fayetteville to work as the chief of air traffic control, and the family would be there for as long as his job needed him. Gary was a military man and ranked as a captain in the US Air Force. Katie was a stay-at-home mom, and this lifestyle seemed to work for them. They loved their kids, loved their marriage, and it just seemed like a really wholesome household to grow up in. The Eastburns would remain in Fayetteville for about two more years and would enjoy their stay. Everyone in the community just adored them and was happy to have them there, even if it wasn't permanent. But Gary received a job from the Royal Air Force in England, which meant they would be moving again. Not a strange thing for military families to do. Next stop, England. Choo-choo. Get your wellies on, because it's time to start drinking tea and eating scones with the queen. Pip pip cheerio. Okay, I'll stop now. It wasn't uncommon for the girls to go without seeing their dad for long periods. Even though their home base was Fayetteville, Gary was stationed 500 miles away in Montgomery, Alabama for officer training. But the family stayed in contact. Every Saturday, Gary would call Katie and the girls to say hi, check in, yada yada. It was their own little tradition. 
very sweet. And this is a house with little children. It's common for them to be outside playing, making noise, you know, kid stuff. But the next door neighbors noticed that the family hadn't been out and about in a few days, which was super uncommon for the family. Side note, did anyone else get a deep sense of emptiness when their friends were absent from school? You're telling me I have to sit through algebra class alone? That's like my version of hell. All that to say, you are aware when people aren't there, especially people you're close to. The neighbors noticed that the daily newspaper had started piling up on the front porch. These were the types of people who left their house at least once a day, even if it was just to be in the front yard. They never left days worth of newspapers to sit outside. One of the neighbors knocked on the door. No one answered, but he did hear a baby crying. He called over his wife to see if she heard the same thing, and sure enough, she did. They assumed it was the youngest child, Jaina. So with the newspapers, no one answering the door, and the child scream crying in the back, they knew something weird was going on. They called the police and arrived about 15 minutes after the phone call. But when the cops showed up on the scene, they couldn't hear a baby crying. So as cops are known to do, they jumped to conclusions and assumed that the neighbors were confused and hearing things. The neighbors also called the Eastburn's babysitter, Julie, because they couldn't get a hold of the family. This seemed like the best person to get in contact with while they waited for the police. Well, while the police are over here thinking there's no baby crying, Julie straight up looks in the window and sees that it's baby Jaina. She's like, yo, that's the kid. What, why are we wasting time? If a baby screams for that long and no one comes to soothe her, someone needs to get in there and help that baby. Once the officers got the visual confirmation from Julie, they went into the house. Jaina was crying, pale, and just did not look okay. She looked sickly and scared. They took her out of the house because it was apparent she hadn't eaten anything in a very long time and her diaper hadn't been changed in days. The neighbors took Jaina to their house next door and gave her milk. And this girl started sucking down this milk as if her life depended on it. Because it did. She was severely dehydrated and even threw up because she couldn't keep up with the rate at which she was drinking. Sadly, Jaina would be the only survivor found in the Eastburn's house. She was taken to the hospital, and thank God they rescued her when they did. She would have lost her life had she stayed in the house alone for another hour. While Jaina was being nursed back to health, the bodies of her two sisters and her mother would be found in the most horrific state imaginable. In the parents' bedroom, 32-year-old Katie was found on the floor next to her bed. She had an incredibly deep slash to her neck and 15 lacerations on her chest. Her undergarments and bottoms had been cut off of her body and there were signs of forced relations. On the other side of the bed was three-year-old Erin. She was found with a pillow covering her face and slash on her neck. It cut so deep that her head was almost detached from her body. Lastly, five-year-old Kara was found in her own bedroom, hiding underneath her Star Wars blanket. She had multiple lacerations to the chest. So all three victims had been found with their throats slashed. I know that these cases can be really gruesome, so if you need to take some time to regroup, I completely understand. It's hard for me to wrap my head around how someone could do something this awful but then to add innocent children to the mix, it's vile. Gary was contacted by the police shortly after his family's bodies were discovered. He wasn't given any more info other than there had been a passing in the family and he needed to come home ASAP. I can't even imagine getting that call. You're hundreds of miles away from work, getting ready to make a huge move with your family and this happens? I don't think I could move. I would just be in total shock. The second Gary answered the phone, he knew something wasn't right. He had been trying to reach Katie for days with no response, so he expected the worst. They had a set schedule for when they would call each other. They would send letters all the time. She never missed a phone call. But the cops wouldn't tell him who the victim was or how many there were for that matter. So he hopped on a plane for Fayetteville and headed to the police station. Investigators got to work immediately. And while this is a horrifying tragedy, 
Humans do be nosy, and everyone wanted to know what happened. Once they were told it was the East Burns, you could feel the mood shift instantly. Detectives talked to Julie, the babysitter, and she told them that Katie was sure she had a stalker. She had been receiving prank calls for months before the murders. Yeah, you heard that right. Months. Whoever was calling would just say really gross, creepy stuff. A lot of the time they would bring up inappropriate situations involving Katie. No one knew who this person was though. As the house was searched, investigators noted that all of the window and door latches were unlocked and the bulk of the struggle happened in the living room. Officials were doing luminol tests all throughout the house, the walls, the floor, everywhere. And well, 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 wouldn't you know it, it was evident that someone tried to clean up a mess. There was still a lot of blood at the crime scene, but not nearly as much as there should have been, considering the degree of violence and how many victims there were. But whoever committed this crime didn't do an excellent job of hiding their tracks. It was done in such a sloppy way. For example, there were red fingerprints all over the place, as well as fluid-soaked towels, possibly to clean up the crime scene. Shoe tracks were found inside and outside of the home, and DNA evidence was discovered inside of Katie's body. But what the heck was the motive? What could be the reason for two children to be brutally murdered in their own home? Gary was taken to the crime scene to see if anything had been stolen. An envelope with some cash, Katie's ATM card, and PIN number had been taken. But that was it. That's it? All this tragedy for some cash and an ATM card? It doesn't seem worth it. There had to be something else. So remember Jaina, the two-year-old who almost lost her life from dehydration? Well, that little girl started going to a child psychologist to work through the trauma of that terrible experience. She told her doctor that her house was scary. She needed to hide and be quiet so that the bad man wouldn't get her. This led the psychologist to believe that Jaina's sisters, Kara and Erin, had come into her room to warn her. They likely told her to stay quiet and hide so she wouldn't get hurt. This is why Jaina survived and her sisters did not. They protected her, even in their final moments. And you might be thinking, Jaina was the only survivor and she didn't even see the person who did it. How are they going to catch a runaway killer? Thankfully, a man named Patrick Cohn talked to the police as they were discovering the bodies. He saw a tall, blonde, white man with a mustache wearing a members-only jacket walking away from the Eastburn house at around 3.30 in the morning, two days before the family was found. He had on jeans and a knit cap and was seen carrying a trash bag as he left. Here's some good advice for all my morning joggers out there. Don't trust mustache men who carry around trash bags in the wee hours of the morning. He passed Patrick, told him he was getting an early start to his day, and got into his white Chevette. Patrick was a janitor and was leaving his girlfriend's home early that morning, which is why he was awake at the same time as the killer. He had a criminal record, so that made his statement a little less believable. But come on, that's a lot of detail. Down to the members only jacket? This guy is giving you exactly what you need. They had Patrick sit down with the police sketch artist to work on the picture they eventually released to the public. This made things a lot easier for people to come forward now that they knew what their guy looked like. A woman came forward saying she saw a tall blonde guy with a mustache withdrawing money from an ATM machine two days after the incident. Remember that missing ATM card? Ooh, we're gonna get you, buddy. You can't keep hiding for long. Things started to fall into place. We have the car, we have the description of the guy, and Julie, the babysitter, had given investigators a solid lead. Katie had put an ad in the newspaper looking to rehome her dog, Dixie. They were moving to another country and didn't want to put the pup through all of that. Julie received a phone call from a woman named Angela Hennis a couple of days before the tragedy. She was interested in picking up the dog. Julie had taken down Angela's information on a note so Katie could get back to her. But when investigators went to check the house for a note, nothing was found. Oh, and Dixie the dog was nowhere to be found. Well, Angela Hennis realized that they had the Eastburn's dog, and her husband, Tim Hennis, owned a white Chevette. Once they noticed this, 
Tim drove down to the police station to talk with investigators. However, he told them that he had seen the family on Thursday the 7th, way before the family was found, and picked up the dog Dixie. Tim admitted to calling Katie the morning of the crime to finalize any questions about the dog, but as for the afternoon and evening, Tim Hennis didn't have an alibi. A little backstory on Mr. Tim Hennis. He was a 27-year-old army sergeant, a husband, and a new father to a little girl. He also looked just like the police sketch put into the media days before. Investigators got all kinds of stuff from good old Tim. Fingerprints, hair samples, blood samples, saliva, the works. Then they sent him on his merry way, knowing full well that they had the main suspect for this crime, and created a lineup for Patrick Cohn to look at. Immediately, Tim's face was chosen out of the bunch. They got to questioning those closest to Tim to learn more about him, his habits, and if anyone noticed him acting super weird lately. And he was acting weird all right. A few of his neighbors witnessed him burning objects in a barrel outside his home for more than a couple of hours, which right off the bat is a sketchy thing to do. They also noted that he had never done that before. A new hobby perhaps? I think not. Then Tim's landlord came forward to let police know he had been late on rent but paid the $345 charge just a few days after the murders. What a coincidence! He had just stopped off at the ATM to withdraw some cash. To put the cherry on top, a local dry cleaner told investigators that Tim had come in a couple of days after the tragedy to clean his members only jacket. All the evidence is really stacked against this guy. You'd think he'd be in jail by now, right? Wrong. Tim Hennis was arrested and charged on three counts of first degree homicide, but refused a plea deal saying he wasn't going to admit something he didn't do. Right, sure Jan. But the DNA samples he had given police all came back inconclusive. But it was the 80s, okay? The only thing they had figured out back then was hairspray and TV dinners. Forensic science wasn't at the top of the priorities list, apparently. Almost an entire year after the incident, Tim Hennis went to trial for executing Katie, Kara, and Aaron Eastburn. Annoyingly, none of the evidence could be matched up, but that didn't stop the jury from seeing through this complete disgrace for a human being. Tim Hennis was found guilty and given a fatal sentence, but Tim would try to appeal this. In 1988, they went back to trial on account of the prosecution showed too many graphic images to the jury, and Tim's face had been in the media swaying witnesses. Patrick Cohn was first up to the witness stand, and the defense wanted to poke holes all through his story and credibility, even going as far as to bring a meteorologist to prove the night was too dark and overcast to see anything clearly. Tim's defense team brought up that the DNA found in the home was inconclusive and didn't belong to their client. And the burning barrel thing? It was tested and nothing weird was found. Sadly, the jury would come back with a not guilty verdict and Tim Hennis would walk away a free man. Tim went on to rejoin the army, getting back pay from his time in jail, and he received a bunch of medals for serving in Somalia and Saudi Arabia. In 2004, he retired from the army, settled down, and became his son's Boy Scout leader. But don't worry, the gross excuse for a human won't stay out of jail for long. In 2006, forensic technology had advanced a long way from where it was in the 70s and 80s. DNA evidence from the crime scene and the samples collected from Katie were tested again. It was confirmed that Tim Hennis's DNA matched the samples from Katie's body. At this point, Tim had gone to trial over the slayings, and the prosecution was facing double jeopardy, meaning they couldn't go to court again. But Tim was a military man, and that means there's a loophole. The U.S. Army listed Tim as active duty again so he could go to court again. The courtroom at Fort Bragg was packed to the brim as his defense team tried for a third time to prove his innocence. The prosecution knew this was their time. They had so much on this guy. The only thing the defense hadn't tried was the possibility of an affair. They tried to say Katie was lonely from Gary being away, and when Tim arrived to pick up the dog, that's when they had their affair. Just because someone is lonely doesn't mean they're gonna cheat, okay? What a weak defense. 
Tim Hennis was found guilty, dishonorably discharged from the army, and received a fatal sentence. Again, he is the only person to ever be tried three times for the same crime and receive both guilty and not guilty verdicts. And now, his ugly face is sitting in prison, where he belongs. I'd like to end on a quote from Gary. I'm perfectly happy if he spends the rest of his life in jail. However, if they did execute him, it was no more than he deserved. Rest in peace to the beautiful Eastburn girls. You were taken from this world too soon. Well, there you have it, folks. The tragic murders of Katie, Kara, and Aaron Eastburn. Do you think Tim deserves life in prison or the ultimate penalty? I agree with Gary. He can rot for the rest of his life, but it wouldn't be any less than what he deserves if they decide to pull the plug. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.